Good afternoon, everyone. Health and Human Sciences researchers are taking great giant leaps to improve lives in Indiana and around the globe. Thank you for joining us for the second in a series of HHS Learn and Lunch presentations during Purdue's 150th anniversary year-long celebration. The College of Health and Human Sciences is grateful for the HHS Alumni Board's contribution to this program. I am pleased to introduce today's presenters. Angie Abbott is an Assistant Dean of the College of Health and Human Sciences and the Associate Director for Purdue Extension. As a registered dietitian, she is also an Extension Specialist in the area of nutrition education programs that targeted limited resource audiences. She has professional experience in the areas of education, research, community, and clinical practice. Tim Gavin is a professor of head and the head of the Department of Health and Kinesiology and a fellow of the American College of Sports and Medicine. His research focuses on the effects of exercise and chronic diseases such as aging, obesity, and diabetes on skeletal muscle health. Together, they have focused their efforts on two Indiana counties with over 40% adult obesity rates and with a combined population of approximately 90,000 residents. In collaboration with local partners, their goal is to build sustainable health-oriented coalitions focused on identifying areas of community need and implementing evidence-based strategies to increase access to healthy foods and opportunities for physical activity. We hope you will enjoy this presentation. Thank you, Emily. Um, just so we're clear, I'm Tim Gavin. <laughs> I'm Angie Abbott. And we're excited to have everybody here today. Uh, what we're going to talk to you about is some efforts that we've worked together on to look at how do we reduce obesity in a couple of counties in southern Indiana. Um, so as we, I, as we start to talk about it, um, what we were looking at was really a community approach. And we can talk about how we address obesity in multiple ways. We can discuss what happens at the cellular level. We can talk about how we make food choices. We can talk about what happens when you exercise. And what we're gonna to talk to you about today is how do we work with communities? How do we get communities to recognize the challenges they face and what might be effective solutions to get them to try and address those challenges? So very conversational. Angie and I want it to be very conversational. I know I'm happy to take questions as we go along. Um, and I will be honest too, as I started to build the presentation, I got into my science mode and I got into statement of the problem. What's the background? What did we do? And I realized that's not where I wanted to go. <laughs> so hopefully you'll see too, very conversational in how we're going to approach it. So really, what's the problem? Um, gonna give you some data. We hear about this all the time, just to get us on the same page. So obesity rates have tripled over the last 30 years. And the prevalence of obesity in the United States right now is approaching 40%. I always tell the students, think about that when you walk past someone on the street. Two out of every five people you will run into will be obese, okay? Indiana struggles with many areas related to obesity, overall health, physical inactivity, access to healthy foods, and our public funding for efforts in these areas is among the worst in the United States. So we face very severe challenges here in Indiana that many states don't face. I think most frightening probably for those of us who talk about the impact of obesity is what's happening in our children, okay? So what we see is that um, close to 14% of our two to five year olds are obese. Currently, if we look at our kids, it is currently projected that if these rates continue, 57% of the US population will be obese by, the age, by their age of 35. That if a child, now we now can start to predict, based on a two-year-old, if you have a two-year-old who is obese, they have a 75% chance of being obese when they become an adult. These are staggering numbers, and the healthcare cost associated with these will be staggering as well. Current estimates is that we spend almost 20% of all of our medical dollars on obesity-related diseases, or over $190 billion a year related to obesity. So it's not just the health problems, but it's the financial side. 
So one of the things that ENG9 we're interested in is talking about how do we prevent this. We're not going to be able to treat our way out of this. We will have to find ways to prevent these events from happening. And it's not just the medical costs. We lose almost eight and a half billion dollars a year, billion with a B, in absenteeism for obesity related issues. That's worker productivity that all of us, whether we're here at Purdue or whether we're working in industry here, Caterpillar, Alcoa, what have you, those are going to be things that are going to have to be figured out. All right, so one of the things we'll talk to you about some, and what you'll, what, if you know these counties, these counties are Jackson and Lawrence counties in Southern Indiana, they're rural. One of the things to keep in mind is Indiana is a rural state. On average, we're more rural than the average US state by about 5%. So we have about 20% of our population live in rural communities. And when you live in rural communities, and we don't think of it this way, we think of people farming out on the land, doing these kinds of things. However, when you live in these rural communities, you can face serious, uh, health disparities. And when we talk about health disparities, what we're discussing are things that may be different because of who you are. One that we talk about a lot is, for example, race. We know there are health disparities based on different races. Here, what we're using is rural as also being a health disparity. And in part, that's due to the fact that you get geographic isolation. So we've been to county, we've been around the counties, and we went to Medora, Indiana, had anybody ever heard of Medora, Indiana before? There we go, a handful, all right. I hadn't. Medora hosts the smallest school corporation in the state of Indiana that has pre-kindergarten through 12th grade of 233 students in their entire school corporation. That is a, that, and it's a relatively large geographic area. So these are some of the area, these are some of the issues that we face. We can also face poverty, education losses, and access to, access to physical activity and fruits and vegetables. And these disparities are also associated with low socioeconomic status. And they can create food deserts, places where we either cannot get healthy foods or the cost of those foods is so high. And we've worked some to try and address that in these counties. And also, inability to uh, access to physical activity. Typically, these will be things like rural roads. No shoulders, clearly no sidewalks. It's very difficult in rural communities to just walk outside your door and get physical activity. So they really face some challenges that are unique. And even if we look at obesity rates, urban, ob urban levels of obesity tend to be lower, in part because in an urban setting, especially the more urban it is, City like Chicago, lots of walking around. You walk from your home to the bus stop, from the bus stop to work, so you get a lot of informal activity. So what we know, we know that re reducing obesity is, takes everybody to be involved. It requires environmental changes, policy changes, systems changes, and we have to approach it from multiple perspectives. We know too that when we look at interventions, it has to include everybody. We cannot do these types of interventions in isolation. We cannot just focus on schools, right? Last time I checked, five-year-olds don't do a lot of grocery shopping. So we really have to address families in this and we have to bring everybody together. Our communities, all right? Our public offices, that's the only way we're going to be able to see long-term sustainable changes. And if we want to address it, we're not going to go in, and we were there for two years. We're not going to make people reduce the obesity levels, but we want to put things in place. And so in 2016, the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, put out a call, and they were looking for partners. And they said, we want to partner with people, we want to tackle obesity, in these counties that had adult obesity rates above 40%. Right now, the 
obesity, the adult obesity rate on average across the United States is about 32%. Okay, so these are very high uh, percentages. And in particular, these are Lawrence and Jackson counties. And the other piece was they said, oh yeah, and we want you to work with extension. Now, I'm lucky because I know people in extension. I know Angie. So that helped us tremendously in being able to approach this problem. So what do we do? All right. Well, we partnered with the CDC on a $1.15 million grant. And this money went into the counties. We engaged with local community stakeholders, right? And we used evidence-based approaches, behavioral approaches, um, environmental approaches to try and impact these communities. And probably what really was attractive to the CDC for us is we used a um, coalition, a health coalition based model. So what we really wanted to do was build teams. We really wanted to build teams in these counties that could help solve their own problems. But the very first thing we did was we formed our own team. And I cannot tell you how important it was to get good people on board. So one of the first things we did was Angie said, you should doc talk to Donna Vandergraaf. <laughs> it's like, Donna who? Oh, I know Donna, yeah. Donna it did a wonderful job. So here's, our, here's part of our team here. Uh, Lindley McDavid, Karen Dubois, Ellie Broughton, uh, Donna Vandergraaf, Molly Marshall, uh, Chris Meyer, and Tanya Hall. So bringing Donna on board was tremendously helpful. She was wonderful to work with, and there's no way we could have done it without her. I couldn't imagine doing this without her. And then we did a couple of other really smart things because Donna told me to do them. Uh, one of the things Donna told me to do was make sure we got Lindley involved, and Lindley did all of our evaluation. Being able to identify what was working in the communities and help us track our progress. The other thing Donna told me to do was she said, you know, we're going to build some champions, get these community champions. They're going to be advocates and help organize down in the counties. We should really get people who are from there. So Karen is from Lawrence County, and Chris is from Jackson County. And by having people who know the communities already was a big win. Now, I grew up in Indiana, okay? And I've lived in the northern part of the state where I was born and went to uh, um, my early schooling. And I lived in the southern part of Indiana where I went to college at a, another Big Ten <laughs> institution <laughs> that, like Lord Voldemort, will not be named. <laughs> However, I hope you notice, some of us are wearing appropriate attire, <laughs> and some of us struggle with it. <laughs> so I've seen, and actually where we went to school is very, is adjacent to some of these county areas. So I'm very familiar with them um, in what we did. The other pieces, Molly is from um, Jackson County as well. And then the last piece, and what I thought was just wonderful ideas that we got when we sat down together and really started to think about how we wanted to attack this problem. Angie said, well, what about community development? What about an economic community development officer? And I said, yeah, uh, what? She said, we do this. Purdue Extension works in communities and they help build economic development. What about if we start to use this model? And that's what we did. And we got Tanya, who is an economic development person and an expert in building coalitions. You think that sounds pretty easy to do. We're going to get a group of people in the room. They all live around here. They all know these are problems. And we'll just figure it out. Oh, oh, having someone who can manage. Because you start to see when we get in these rooms, you start to see how different personalities interact. And having someone who can do that was, was wonderful to have happen. All right, so what were our goals? We wanted to increase knowledge about healthy eating and physical activity across the lifespan. We wanted to build these community coalitions, all right, so that they can help us identify the needs, identify the solutions, and be part of the solutions, okay? 
and we wanted to increase ac access to healthy foods and physical activity. So what was our approach? This is, this is based in community development. Okay, I can't take credit for it. Uh, just Donna and Angie mentioned it to me, and the only thing I did was go, that sounds like a really good idea. So I always think, and I'm sure you do too, work with really good people, and it makes you look good. I cannot tell you how this project did that exactly for me. So what do we do? So the five principles of this development is collaborate. So we built healthy coalitions so that we could get people across the spectrum of community, public offices, schools, local uh, healthcare hospitals, what have you, build it across the community. So what we're really trying to do was get everybody we could think of at the table. This is where Karen and Molly and Chris said, oh, you've got Joe and Sue and Bob, all right, well, you need Carol. Carol's not here, we gotta make sure we get Carol. Having those local people who could call and say, hey, we're doing this, we need you to be part of this, was critical. Then we train the community champions. We learn how to do um, environments and how to act like a coalition. We then ask these coalitions, we empowered these coalitions to assess what the problems are. We went out to hospitals because we know they have to do needs assessment. Let's get their reports. Let's get the other reports that have happened around the counties and let's bring those together. But we task the coalition with doing it. Not Angie, not Tim, not Donna. The coalitions were responsible for it. Then we ask the coalitions to develop the strategies. What are their priorities? What are the things we should do in your community? And we would not do anything in the community until we had sign off that the coalition said, this is what we want to do. We had people come to us and say, hey, we'd like to do this. And our very first question back to them was, what did the coalition say? If we circumvented that, we would have not empowered them to be the change implementers. And then the last piece, and this will take time to figure out if it works, is trying to make it sustainable. By building this coalitions, by empowering them, using some of the funds we got from the CDC for, for successes, all right, to implement the things, we'll show you some examples here in a sec, to implement those, ways for them to show that they're making a difference and an impact in communities, to empower them, and then trying to transfer the activities we did to the local communities. All right, so this community development also is based upon a belief that the solutions are in your communities. You know your community and you can be the change maker. You can be the people who help us solve it. You know what would work here and what won't. I can tell you growing up in Indiana, no one likes to be told what to do. I can't tell you why that's true here, but it sure as heck is. And we knew if we went in those communities and say, oh, you should do ABC, they would just look at us like, you don't even know who we are. We want to do X, Y, Z. How do you not even know that? So by knowing the solution lies in those communities and working with them was fundamental. Then we had community networks sharing information amongst themselves, not allowing people to be siloed with that information, trusting each other. There is, if we can, you go into communities and there can be a lot of distrust. Big town in the county is distrusted by the smaller towns. How do we get those small communities to participate? We've got to build a common vision. When the coalition says this is what you wanted to implement, that's our common vision. And then we identify what our assets are that we can use to try and implement these changes. And then we use some good, good practices. Mentoring, and this is where Tanya, and there's a picture of Tanya leading some of our um, group discussions. Just a wonderful job. Taking it, and we sometimes, truly, you get a group of people. It can get pulled by one or two people into directions you don't need to go. And Tanya just was able to really do a great job of bringing everybody, letting some of those ideas come on the table, making sure people are heard, but still bringing it back to where it needs to go. Fundamental. And then show, teach, build capacity. 
that is what we plan is our plan for sustainability. And so this is kind of that community development where we do assets, we look for wins, we look for community partners, try and build common vision, try and get together regularly. And you, we just need someone in the county too. It's like, don't forget, monthly meeting, Monday, two o'clock, community center, everybody be there. Someone has to send that email out. It's easy for everybody to look and think, oh, Angie's gonna do it. And Angie's like, no, Tim's gonna do it. All right? And then trying to be this change agent to help maintain these efforts. So what were our successes? Here we've got a short video. Last I checked, it does work. No promises. When we learned about the obesity rate in adults and, and the younger population, teenagers and younger kids, um, it, was, it was shocking. It's an obesity grant uh, with the two counties in Indiana um, that were above the obesity rate and uh, Lawrence County, Jackson County were the two counties in Indiana. The Purdue Extension kind of walked us through the, the process and, and helped us out tremendously with getting all the exercise equipment, signage for our Blue Jacket Trail, um, and they've been a tremendous help. The Blue Jacket Trail has uh, primarily two uh, uh, pluses. One is the, uh, the physical activity and the bonus of um, being able to reconnect with people that I haven't seen that are now on the trail. So uh, it's, a, uh, it's, it's, it's used rather frequently by a lot of people of a, a wide range of, a, of ages. Our individual projects in Park and Rec were everything from uh, menu boards at our parks we bid out that process to concessionaires, so we wanted a policy change that said if you get this contract, you have to serve so many healthy items. A big portion of it was um, our bike lanes and trails, uh, the paint uh, for the roads and lanes, that was a part of that. And they helped us with the 40 signs that were a part of that. And then uh, you can see behind me the, the big addition uh, is the fitness court in our community and they were a major sponsor uh, with the fitness court. For years, Boys and Girls Clubs um, were kind of just seen as an after school program. And so uh, we're so much more than that. We're trying to become a community uh, hub for a lot of things going on. And so one thing we did through the grant, the coalition, is, is we started making healthy choices in our vending machines. We haven't completely taken out all of the bad choices, but getting those healthier choices, we see kids that, that will actually take advantage of them. Uh, we wanted kids to learn that no matter where you are in town, you can, you can grow your own food, grow your own healthy food. So we did start uh, with the help of the grant. We started our uh, summer garden and taught kids how to, how to plant tomatoes and cucumbers and peppers. Um, and then with the Ninja Warrior course, uh, we originally had that intended just for our, our preschool kids and, and early elementary, but it's actually worked out for all of our kids. We opened a tot indoor playground that allows uh, six months to five years come in and use our facility in the morning when it's not being used. So those kids uh, can use that for healthy play. We're already seeing over 40 families involved with that program and that they come on a regular basis. So when it's rainy and cold, they can come inside to the Boys and Girls Club and find healthy outlets to continue to be active. Personally, I think it's a, a step in the right direction. It's, it's not uh, the positive news that you hear when you're one of two counties that has you know, an, an obesity rate that's, that's uh, concerning. Um, and when you see steps being taken to improve that and a group uh, or an organization that's willing to get involved and help you resolve that or help you make positive strides, uh, that becomes, that's a very positive feeling from that standpoint. If it weren't for the coalition and if it wasn't for uh, Healthy Jackson County and the CDC grant through Purdue Extension, uh, I'm not sure we would have made these changes as quickly. But having Healthy Jackson County and their support, our healthy lifestyles um, really just, we pushed that up a lot quicker. With the relationship we've developed with Purdue Extension and, and the City Park Board there and all the efforts from Purdue Extension. We have seen a larger number of people outside using the Blue Jacket Trail, going to the parks, 
Um, they take breaks on the benches that were also part of the grant. They use the bike racks. And um, we just hope that number continues to grow. This is awesome! So I get the opportunity to talk about um, a lot of the great, um, you saw in the video, a lot of the successes that the, the communities decided. And I want to make that very clear. We didn't go in and say, you need to do this, you need to do that. After they looked at their needs assessment, as a community coalition, they made decisions about what sort of things they wanted to implement in their community. And we, we went with whatever they said um, they wanted to do. In a lot of cases, we used some of the money from the CDC to make these things work. But in some cases, we looked at what other assets or volunteers or things there were in the community um, that helped them make the decisions about which opportunities we we were going to take advantage of. You heard on the video, both of the communities um, did this, this healthy vending or concession stand things, which I thought was really interesting. If you think about where families go when they're not at home and they're not at school, right? And the coalition said, we spend a lot of, a lot of nights at, you know, in, at a concession stand, at a baseball game, or at a basketball game, or, you know, we, a lot of times we're busy in the evenings and that's where we're at. And, and sometimes, you know, think about what are the, the options when you go to a basketball game at the concession stand. And so they said, if, if we had healthy options, we're not gonna take away the other ones, that would be great if we had options to choose from. And I really liked it that they both decided to do their vending process where they put out bids and they would only accept bids from people that included healthy choices back. And so, you know, that was a good policy system that they made, um, and they did that with their parks department, they did that um, with their schools, the athletic departments were involved, the PTOs, um, all sorts of groups that were involved in concession stands. So that was, and then they, they used some of the CDC resources to make signage um, to sort of highlight what the, the healthy menu options were that, that were available. And um, in Lawrence County, they needed um, signage and information to help the community understand about their Blue Jacket Trail. Um, as Tim talked about, you know, you can all think about uh, the country roads in Indiana. And I don't know about you, but if you've ever tried to walk on run on them, of course they want the water to, so they've kind of got the slant, you know, that goes down. And so anyways, um, they have this trail in Lawrence County, but a lot of people didn't know about it, didn't know which way they'd be on the trail. And you know, you'd go so far and then they're not sure, does the trail stop here or do I turn? Will I come back to where I started? So again, signage and things like that to promote um, that, that trail in Lawrence County was an option that, that one of the communities chose. Um, another one of the communities chose um, safe routes to schools. So, you know, the young people, again, when we were thinking about this grant, um, we, we weren't necessarily focused on that 40% of adult obesity that were already obese, right? We decided to think about prevention strategies headed forward. Um, and you can imagine these communities didn't necessarily like getting the phone call from me at Purdue Extension, like, guess what? You qualify for a CVC grant because you're one, you're the two counties that are 40%. Like, you win, you know? That's not a fun phone call to get. You don't want to be on that list, right? Um, and so, so thinking about with those communities, how do we look at what our assets are? They, these communities have great assets. How do we look at those assets and, and turn them around to help sort of prevention strategies? So they had, um, they, they did have some sidewalks and stuff, just not the, the signage and the crosswalks and stuff to help people think about this is where you cross the road. If, if you lived in the community down this sidewalk, your kids could walk to school and, and here's the crosswalk. So, so the signage and the crosswalk didn't exist. And so those are the types of things that the communities decided. If we had these things, more kids would walk to school. One of the communities I thought had a really clever idea and they um, developed this, um, and I'm gonna think about what the name is or I'm gonna get it right. Help me, Tim, what's the name of that? The 
Inclu the Mitchell Inclusion Garden. That's what they called it, the Mitchell Inclusion Garden. And they got a whole bunch of volunteers. A lot of supplies um, were donated. And they created this garden in Mitchell in one of their parks that were designed for people in wheelchairs. So it was raised beds. They, they had the, the raised beds built so that you know people who could stand up. You didn't have to bend over to get to your garden. The garden is all up. And then they made it nice nice paths and things around them so you could easily get a wheelchair around and through the park and still participate in the gardening program. And so um, again, they very, if, if any, I'm not even sure that any of the CDC funds were used for this project. It was all volunteer and, and donations from the community of coming together and deciding this is one of the strategies that they wanted to implement. I thought um, this was a really creative way that the music was a creative way to sort of bring attention to the crosswalks in their community. Um, so that was fun. And um, both of the communities worked with the different youth serving organizations to start gardens um, in, in various youth serving organizations. So lots of community gardening type of work as well. So those are some of the um, successes. So let me talk a little bit about, about what worked. Definitely what worked, when you give the community the information, they can make the decisions about what's gonna work in their community. So given all of the control over to the community worked. And um, that's something that we're gonna continue to use through Cooperative Extension. Flipping the challenges into goals. So I talked about identifying those assets in the community. They had some great things working, but they also had some challenges and gaps. What we did, what we helped them do through the community development process is looked at what their challenges were and said, how about if you turn those challenges into your goals, right? So those, instead of looking at them as a negative, let's turn those into that's what we want to change. So we flipped those in, into goals. Um, building health coalitions unique to each community. Tim sort of alluded to the fact that, um, you know, you go into a community and CDC defined what the geographic region was, right? They said it's based on county. Well, we know not necessarily all communities identify with county, right? But that's what CDC said, so that's what we had to work it with. Um, but we did have one of our communities had these sort of two sort of cities that we're like, no, what's gonna work for that town isn't gonna work for our town. We're, we're in the same county, but, but we do things different. And so that idea of thinking about the, the stakeholders define community, right? And so letting the stakeholders define what their community is and letting them make, make the decisions based on how they define community. So that was, you know, that's one of the things that comes with these funding opportunities. The funding was, use it for this county. But in reality, that's not way, the way necessarily the world works. Um, and then within these health coalitions, they formed committees, and then those committees identified what their, their top interventions are gonna be. And um, one of the things that we started working on from the very beginning, and this is, as you see here in a second when I talk about where we're needing to go, thinking about building community leadership all of these people that are involved in these coalitions have other jobs. They're volunteers. Like, we hired people through the grant to sort of be the leaders, but we knew after two years that money was going to run out and they were going to go away. So how do you start to build leadership and community capacity so when that grant money runs out, the work can, can keep going? And so that's, that's a constant sort of struggle, especially in these small communities. You know, the... the all of them have multiple jobs and there's very limited volunteers. So those are things that we have to think about as, as we work in communities. Um, so areas that were needing attention, um, we, they struggled. If whatever the seat of the county was or the big city is usually where the activity started, it's usually where the extension office is the Purdue Extension Office is located. So sometimes it was hard to get participation from those other small towns because they're like, yeah, whatever they're gonna do, it's gonna be for Seymour, right? Because Seymour's the seed and they always get all the resources. So we had to deal with a little bit of that. Um, the, no probably shocker in this room, they weren't real interested in strategic planning. <laughs> so, um, so anyways, that was something that there wasn't a whole lot of interest about. What they were more interested in were these, these sort of one-off events, right? Let's host a 5K. Let's have a health fair. 
right? They didn't want to think about what are some bigger things that we can do. Those were easy wins. And so sometimes it was hard for us to, to get them past that sort of easy win thinking. And then again, the, the idea of transferring this leadership to community agencies, right? When the money runs out to pay for this champion that we were paying for with the CDC funds, who's going to be the leader of this group? Who's going to send the email to tell people to get together? Who's going to push their colleagues to keep these interventions moving forward? And so that is actually there's there's lots of good data that shows that's one of the struggles with community-based health coalitions is the leadership. If you don't have someone leading it, it falls apart real quick. And so leadership is an important piece um, that, that needs um, to be thought about. And that goes along with long-term long sustainability. Leadership is key to the long-term sustainability. So what's our next steps? Um, we, we know that moving forward, if we do this work, which we will continue through Purdue Extension to do this work in other communities in, in Indiana, is you let the stakeholders define the community, right? The d stakeholders define what the geographic boundaries are going to be. And we need to build and support community capacity and leadership within rural communities. One of the things is they just need to know they can do it, right? I mean, sometimes it's like oh, so overwhelming. You look at the data, oh my goodness, 40% of us are obese. Like, how are we going to turn the ship around? And so part of it is just looking at, like, we're not going to fix everything. Let's choose a couple of things, small wins, and get those moving. And that's what happened. You start small, and then they're like, oh, we did that. Now we can build an inclusion garden, right? Or we can write a small grant and get money to do signage for our trails. And so you start out with the small wins and then start to help them see that there are bigger things. Um, we really want to continue to help communities to think about using da data to drive their decisions. As I th one of the mayors said on the video, like, I couldn't even believe our, our county was 40% or more obese, right? So there was a local elected official that didn't even know that there was this health issue, okay? So using data to help, help the communities make decisions, using the health needs assessment and things like that. And then, you know, always trying to connect the, these communities to additional resources. Many of those resources, we have expertise on this campus that can help, help these communities answer some of these difficult questions. So helping communities get connected to Purdue, but not only Purdue, there are all sorts of resources across the state and across the nation. And so helping them, them get connected to those. And so with that, um, we want to stop and open it up for questions. And if I recall, we'll need to wait for the microphone to get to you. It won't, you won't hear the volume. It's just for the camera. So with that, we'll open it up to any questions you might have. Well, as we wait for our first question, one of the things I learned, and this is the, this is the only place I've worked in a land-grant institution. I cannot tell you what an absolute pleasure it was getting to know Extension much better. Extension at Purdue and the trust the communities have with Extension at Purdue is outstanding. And if you're thinking about ways you want to be in rural communities or communities across the state, I, I don't want to speak for Angie, but I'm sure she would say, well, give me a call. It, absolutely, absolutely. So we have a health and human science extension educator and other extension educators that cover ag community development and 4-H youth development in all of the 92 counties. So we have resources and people there that, that can get connected. So lots of opportunities. And our boss has a question, yes, so I think we does. should call on her. <laughs> Thank you for a really outstanding presentation. That was just wonderful. And I love the pairing of the, the scientific perspective and the stress of the importance of working with the community and taking the ideas from the community. Um, I have a question, a very basic question about sort of the science of obesity and then how you communicate that to the public. So I understand that it matters how much we move and it's very good for us to exercise and exercise helps to prevent obesity. I also understand that we need to make healthy choices about eating and not eat too much. I know the public health message must be that both matter. That's the, I, I accept that. 
Is it not the case that what we eat is a little more determining of obesity, or is that true? I mean, if you had to say which is most important in preventing obesity and in reducing it, if you had to pick, right? Well, you, you, you got the you, you got the nutrition person and the exercise person. You should be good. You all can duke it out. No. Yeah. Well, I. Go for it. I mean, even if I had to pick, I'm not sure that I could because I think both of them are so, so important. And sort of the message we usually give is working with communities to make the healthy choice, not focusing on food or physical activity, making the healthy choice the easy choice. That's really the way we communicate with communities is how do you, how do you make, you know, if you got to make a choice, right, that it's easy. So if you're at the vending machine, or you're standing at the concession stand with your kid, you know, and if there is no other choice besides candy and pop and you're hungry, you're gonna choose candy and pop. But if there are other, are other choices, it's easy, they're there, we can make that choice if we want, so. And I would add, when we look at the scientific data, when you look at it from an energy perspective, you can, you can change energy balance equally with both systems. You see similar kinds of problems um, with both systems in how, how people lose. And the biggest issue is you have to, I would say you, you have to clamp, if you're gonna study one, you have to clamp the other. So if you're going to have people who are reducing their caloric intake, it's easy for people to stop being active. You have to maintain their activity. Similarly, if you increase someone's activity, you have to clamp how much they're excess eating because clearly they can eat their way so it looks like a net balance. So when we look at just the energetics of it all, they're very similar because we're talking about the same amount of energy difference. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Well, I was gonna ask a question, but I think based on the energy balance, uh, one quick thing is, it's, it's actually interesting when you get to the uh, energy balance, unfortunately a large amount of that research has actually been funded by Coca-Cola. And so, you know, I think as you're taking a look at that research literature, you should be careful in terms of who published that work. But, you know, I think even irrespective of whether physical activity or nutrition is most important, I think the interesting thing to think about is that we know that physical activity is an independent risk factor for a large number of health outcomes. Um, you know, and there's a lot of work that was done um, in the 80s and 90s looking at how cardiorespiratory fitness is associated with uh, different health outcomes, specifically looking that you could be obese but still have a high level of fitness level and would still be, have certain protective effects. So, you know, I think whether you're looking at whether one is more important than the other, I think looking at the literature that shows that physical activity is definitely offers a lot of independent uh, risk reduction. But I think, um, back to my question though. Um, you know, I think working with communities is really, really difficult. And when you start working with, I think, rural, low-income communities and racial ethnic minority populations, you know, I think everyone in here has got, hopefully everyone in here has gone through city training, that you learn about, uh, unfortunately, a lot of the horrible atrocities that have taken place and potential mistrust with certain communities potentially having fears of partnering up with communities. You know, I think, and then I think related to that is just the fact that a lot of low-income communities are, are are just swamped by. You you look at how many communities in either are in Indiana, and then you look at how many universities there are doing research in Indiana. You know, and I think a lot of them are just swamped with a lot of different requests. So I was wondering if you could kind of highlight some of the the issues that you ran into related to trying to work with communities. I know you highlighted a little bit about that, talking with some of your community champions and working with, with uh, people that were a part of those communities. But I was wondering if you could highlight a little bit more of that work. Sure. So we have extension educators that have been in the community, you know, they're, they're there and they're embedded in the community, so they know the partners. So before we e actually even applied for this grant, we went down and had our local extension educator bring together groups. And we had a conversation with both communities and kind of said, what do you already have going on? You know, is, maybe this isn't needed, right? I mean, maybe this isn't a good time for your community. Communities. And so we had conversations before we even applied for this grant with the communities that, that we were talking to about if it was the right thing. But I can tell you our extension staff do a really good, good job, in my opinion, of, of helping 
try to balance that lots of people coming in and wanting to help, right? Or wanting to collect data or whatever it is. Um, they do a really good job of trying to balance that. Of course, they always want to encourage it, but, but there's a balance, right? I mean, sometimes low end, I, I think I've even shared this example with you, particularly in the situation in Lake County a couple of years ago when they had the lead poisoning um, going on in Lake County, we had several people, low, several faculty, not only on Purdue's campus, but other campuses contact our extension office and, and our people that work in low income communities there, specifically that community that was affected by that situation. And you know, our extension educator said, the community doesn't want all this. You know, they don't want their blood drawn anymore. They don't want, you know, they don't want that anymore. And so having sort of those champions and those people that work and live in the communities were able, at least they knew us well enough at Purdue to say, no, we're done. And so that's hard for us in an academic community when, you know, we want to collect data and we want to help, but the community knows sometimes when that, that stopping point is. One thing I'll add there too, and Ian, I'm, I mean, I'm not an extension. Purdue Extension, and I can't speak to other states, Purdue Extension is well trusted in their communities exactly because of the kind of example Angie gave, which is they have the community's best interest in mind and the communities know that. I was horribly impressed as I got to see the, the health educators in the counties working with their communities and how much trust there was, when in so many times there's not. So fantastic job. And we, well, we hire people who live, work, play and pray in the communities that they serve. And we do that for that very reason. Uh, thank you again. Uh, this was very, very informative. Uh, if I were to take two take home messages, I guess. The first one that I heard is uh, getting the right people in the community to provide uh, trust and empowerment. I think that was the first part. And the second one was almost like a paternalistic approach or nudging towards the right decisions. Make the choice available and then in a very seamless, passive way, just nudge them so that they don't have to really choose, they just do it. What I didn't hear, and here's my question, is whether there was an information gap. I'm an engineer, I tend to think that I need to tell people about the data, and, and I didn't hear that you guys had the challenge with that. So I guess, was there a challenge? People already know, and it's just a matter of implementation, or there is also an information gap that you have to address? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. And actually, I didn't talk about, we had a success that was more of an information. So um, in, in both of the communities, we implemented evidence-based um, nutrition education and physical activity curriculums in their school systems. Um, we did some in the youth-based, um, or the Boys and Girls Club and, and things like that. Um, and, and as a part of the school-based work, that particular evidence-based program that we used um, had a parent component to it that, that we used. But that, that's a small sort of snippet of getting them information. But, but as a part of this grant, there were, was some of that helping educate people about what are the right decisions, right? And then, then part of it was getting the, the environment set up so they could make that, that choice. The other piece, too, that I thought really is by empowering the communities, the communities know what works and what doesn't work. They know where their errors are. They, they know the data. I mean, we can look at the sheet of data. They know the data from seeing it in real life. They can tell you, we go around with our health educators, oh, I can tell you this county has this, this opportunity and not that one. So we, we had that data, and the community, based upon the size of the community you're discussing, really knows what, what's happening there. They, they really did need us to, to talk about, and, and I would say, you know, understanding that healthy eating and physical activity, we really didn't have to tell anybody about that. Like, we didn't have to show them a whole lot of data because they, they already know about the problem. Although certainly, I think, still areas yeah. for improvement because we saw leadership, elected yeah. officials that didn't really know the data. So still lots of opportunity, yeah. So to kind of dovetail off of that question is, um, so how did you guide, well, you know, it, it is important to make 
the community make their own decisions on what interventions they want to put into place. But I guess my question was, how did you guide or did you guide them in making decisions that would be the most impactful? Because I'm sure there were some people that wanted to, you know, build a new restaurant or, I mean, I don't know, some something that may not have been as impactful as, you know, the uh, the Blue Jacket Trail or something like that. So um, we partnered with our community development colleagues who are all trained in facilitation, <laughs> which was key as, as Tanya Hall was, is trained in facilitation skills. And so, and, and they use lots of different processes of which I'm not an expert in and helping people get to what are all the ideas and then how do we prioritize those and how does that match up with our needs assessment mm -hmm. data that, that we had. So they spent a lot of their coalition work getting those sorts of pieces together and then ultimately they were making the decision but but they were making decisions based on lots of different pieces of information right like like maybe this was our highest priority to do um i don't know safe safe routes to school, right? But in this community, eh, we couldn't get through the, the streets department approval to, to do it, right? So it's gonna take us more work to get through those political barriers, so let's go to this one. So they did a lot of that, like thinking through, or in this community, we wanna do this, but we really, it's gonna take some grant writing to bring in some other resources. So let's go to this one because we feel like we can get that until we can get a grant written for this. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. And we had two pieces too. One was each of these, the communities had already tried some of this having coalitions and they all fell apart. So really trying to bring someone in who can facilitate it really brought them back together. The other piece that we didn't show in here was we also brought in experts from outside, we brought in an expert on physical activity in the built environment. And we had them come in and just, you could see when they would put ideas on the table, they said, so here we are, we're walking with the police and the police chief and the fire department chief and the principal of the school. And one of the, th the thoughts was, well, wouldn't you like, then the principal said, we would like a connection between this community, a sidewalk or something, and our school so our students don't have to go on busy roads. And the, the um, expert said, looked at the police chief and the fire chief and said, would you like something that's a little bit wider? So in case there is an incident at the school, you have a back entrance to get in and you don't have to fight all the parents coming in? And they said, we've always wanted that. So could we build a sidewalk that facilitates the kids? So having people who could facilitate those conversations and bring in the communities, the one thing I remember hearing about bringing this expert in was the community said, that's the first time we've had somebody in here who didn't tell us we had to spend $10 million to get started. They said, you know, you could just do this. Put some planners along here to limit cars getting in and out of this parking lot. Just paint some stuff here. Make these kinds of changes. That bought us a lot of goodwill and went a long way. Instead of saying, you know, you need to hire a consultant, you know, that's going to give you a report that says for $10 million, you can transform this community, <laughs> right? Mm. Well, and these are the solutions too are, and you have it in every area. Oh, as soon as someone goes, well, you're going to have to contact the State Department of Transportation and everybody's eyes glaze over. They're like, oh my gosh, it will take forever and it's going to cost us a lot of money. But when he says, oh, you know, you could just paint a line. You could just paint a line down here and make a bike lane because it's wide enough. And so what we would do is we'd buy the paint and the communities would provide the labor. And they would put the, so like this, the crosswalk. Yeah. We bought the paint. Yeah. They provide the labor to put it all together. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great, thank Thanks, you. Thanks everyone.